Welcome, my friends, to a new episode of CELTA Insider. And in this episode, we're going to talk about anticipated problems. And the first question when we come to anticipated problems is why? Why do we need to anticipate problems when we're teaching? Well, I'd say this is a very important planning skill because as teachers, sometimes we, we look at the course book, we look at the lesson we intend to teach. So if we don't think about these problems, we might be in tough situations in the classroom. And, and that's why on a course like CELTA or CERTIS or, or TEFL, um, it's a very um, basic part of the lesson plan to write about your anticipated problems and how you intend to deal with them. But the question is, what should we focus on um, when we come to um, anticipated problems? Uh, what are the areas that we need to focus on? And I would say area number one is language. And simply because this is what we teach. We teach English language, so we need to anticipate problems related to language. We also need to anticipate problems related to materials and problems related to learners. So three main areas that we need to think about. We need to think about language. We need to think about materials. We need to think about learners. Right. And the focus in this episode would be on language, because that's what is tricky. That is what is difficult. When it comes to materials, we might say something like, um, um, the, the data show might not work because of electricity problems. And then in this scenario, I'll be ready maybe with flashcards. Um, so stuff like that. Um, learners, like I have um, a student who's got a uh, very weak eyesight and um, I'll be ready with handouts um, that show the content in a big font. You know, I mean, that sort of stuff. But, but what is really tricky is the language part um, when you write your anticipated problems. And this is why this would be the focus of this episode. So let's see. Problems with language. And when we talk about problems with language, we're talking about three main areas. We're talking about meaning. We're talking about form. And we're talking about pronunciation. These are the three main areas we would focus on when we're teaching language. And we're going to see how we're supposed to handle each area. Now, let's, let's, let's check this together. And let me start by an example um, on grammar from the elementary level. And let's see an example uh, on grammar from the elementary level. And the book is um, American English File, wonderful book. And here is a grammar part. And as you see, we're talking here about be going to. So the question is, what problems might be related to this grammar lesson? So let's think about meaning. Well, I mean, um, as we read here, be going to is used to express future plans. Now, students might be confused between the usage of uh, be going to and the usage of will. And this is a meaning problem, like they might be using be going to in the wrong context. Well, um, and again, we would need to recommend a good solution for that, but that is a problem that you can think of as a teacher. Also, another problem is uh, form. You might write that um, students might forget the usage of verb to be before going to, so they would say something like, I gonna, okay, um, instead of I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, then they, they would drop verb to be and they, they won't use it. Now that's a problem with form. We can also think of um, another problem with pronunciation, which is stressing every part of um, the, the modal expression be going to. So uh, they would say, I am going to instead of I'm gonna. So the pronunciation might be a bit unnatural. 
And, and, and this is how you think about this. So as a teacher, when you're planning and you look at your grammar lesson, that's what you think of when you're trying to come up with anticipated problems. Now, let's see another example. And also we're talking about grammar, but this time we're going to talk about the intermediate level. And we have a wonderful example from face-to-face uh, -face, um, intermediate. And let's have a look at this grammar part. It's actually second conditional. So um, we use the second conditional to talk about imaginary situations we often use, and then, um, and then we have the positive and negative of the second conditional, and we've got a question form. Right, right, right. And then there is a kind of a comparison between the first conditional and the second conditional. So what can be the, the anticipated problems? I mean, the most obvious one when it comes to meanings, students might be confused between the usage of the first conditional and the second conditional. Right, that's one. Um, another problem, students might think that um, the second conditional talks about the past because it's written in past simple, while actually it might talk about the present or the future. Um, so that's also another problem with meaning. Uh, think about form. Uh, students might use uh, will instead of would or can instead of could um, in the second half of the second conditional. Uh, also think about the, uh, the pronunciation part. Students might say I would instead of I'd, so they wouldn't use the contracted form and maybe the pronunciation might sound a bit unnatural. So these are the kinds of, of, of problems that you also can think of when it comes to uh, the second conditional. But what about vocabulary? And let's go to an example from the elementary level. And let's go to the book Face to Face Elementary. And we have here a lesson, and we have here a set of vocabulary um, about places in town. And when you look at the list, you need to think of your elementary students. What might be difficult in terms of meaning? And when I look at this, I'd say, um, we've got building, house, flat, you know. Um, I would say house for Egyptian, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, some Egyptian students would, would use house and flat in the same meaning. Um, so again, so I would need to clarify the difference between a house and a flat, right? Um, and, and this again, um, this confusion sometimes between house and flat for Egyptian students, it happens because um, in Arabic, uh, the word bait might, might refer to um, both uh, places, might refer to houses and might refer also to uh, flats and what makes this also more confusing that in um, some Egyptians when when, when when the family owns a whole block of flats um, they call it uh, bait with that meaning and then they translate they translate it into house which is actually it's um, um, a whole building or a, a block of flats owned by one family but they call it uh, bait, with, and then they translate it into house, and that also um, confuses many students and make them unable to differentiate between house and flat. So that can be something to mention for elementary students. If we're thinking about pronunciation, then we can go to um, 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 many, like we can go to pub. Well, pub can be difficult for meaning and pronunciation for meaning because it's not part of the Egyptian culture. So, and um, that's one thing. Um, also for pronunciation because of the pass sound. So many Egyptian students might say bub instead of pub, right? And, and, and that's uh, another problem. When it comes to spelling, um, we can um, mention actually um, museum. Uh, and that um, some students might find the spelling of museum uh, a bit difficult and, and then we need to write the spelling uh, clearly on a board. So it goes like that. Let's go to a vocabulary lesson from the uh, intermediate level and we have here uh, Interchange by Jack C. Richards. And um, we've got here word 
power events. So we've got, you know, some um, eight vocabulary items. And when we think about meaning, some students, for example, might um, might be confused by the word um, lucky break. They might think that it's it's a negative word, not a positive one, because um, they might think of break as breaking something. And then they would say that this might break luck. So that might be uh, confusing here. Um, also pronunciation. The students might not know how to pronounce uh, predicament. Egyptian students, like they, they might uh, stress the wrong syllables and they might, might say predicament uh, or something like that when, when it's uh, predicament. So again, I mean, that's also another problem. When it comes to um, form, um, the spelling of coincidence would be challenging for many students. And that's why we need to write the spelling on a board. These are examples related to anticipated problems um, from um, two levels, the intermediate and the elementary and uh, vocabulary and grammar. Now, let's see how we're supposed to write our anticipated problems in lesson plans. Let's have a look at this. And I've got here a good example. Um, vocabulary, thorough. Now, we look at thorough. Let's think first um, about meaning. Students might be confused between these two words, through and thorough. That's how you write it. So when you write your anticipated problem, you need to be very specific in writing. Students might be confused between these two words, through and thorough. Don't write something like, students might be confused about the word thorough. Like, like how? How confused? Be specific. And the answer, the solution has to be specific as well. I will clarify the difference in meaning between them using the discrimination between two example sentences, which means that the teacher would be using two sentences, one with thorough, one with through, and he would clarify the difference in meaning for students. Fair enough. Now let's move to a problem with uh, pronunciation. And it says here, students might pronounce thorough a though. Now, look at how I wrote my anticipated problem. I put the wrong pronunciation in there and I wrote it in phonetic transcription. And that's what you need to do in your lesson plans as well. And look at my solution. I said, I will use choral, group and individual drilling, clarifying that it should be pronounced as thorough. And I also used the correct phonetic transcription here. So you need to be very specific um, about your anticipated problems. Another example, but this time about uh, four. And I wrote here, students might not know how to spell the word thorough. And the answer is, I will make sure they can see the form written clearly on the board. Okay, now, examples about grammar. And we have here, uh, used to plus infinitive to express habits and a problem with meaning. Students might think it has the same meaning of the verb use. The answer, I will clarify the meaning using CCQ's concept checking questions. Problems with um, pronunciation. Students might think it is pronounced as used to. Solution. I will use backward drilling and show students that it is pronounced as used to. Right. Problems with form. Students might think that used to is followed by a verb plus ing. I will use a substitution table on the board to show them the difference between be used to and used to. Wonderful. Now, so as you saw, my friends, anticipated problems need to be very specific. They need to be to the point. They need to be super duper clear. Now, let's see some examples from um, some TEFL and CELTA candidates. 
Now let's see some examples from TEFL and Celtic candidates and um, see what I think about um, how they have written their anticipated problems. So, um, oh, we have here the first one. So let's let's discuss these together. And he said, anticipated problems with meaning. Students may think that they can use the term membership in every beneficial activity. They do. University membership, a membership for British bus membership. And then on the other side, as a solution, he said, state to the students that you cannot use the term with everything such as schools, educational institutes, public transport and restaurants. And, and here, you know, I mean, the guy is trying to talk about collocations, but he's not very clear in the way he's writing this. And I expected him to mention something about collocation so that, you know, um, his writing uh, of anticipated problems is better. But but I would, when I look at this, I said, OK, right. But when I look at this, I say, OK, fine. Right. Students may get confused with the aspects that calories can be stored in our body which we can get rid, rid of through exercise and the aspects that it is stored in food um, and actually uh, again uh, it's the, the source of confusion is not clear to me why why students would be confused about calories especially when i think about egyptian students they know about calories. It's one of the words that are used a lot in the media in, you know, when we're talking to each other, we keep talking about calories and we keep talking about, you know, how to go on a diet. So it doesn't sound like a very good anticipated problem here, but let's continue. Um, the solution is state to the students that it is similar to fat in the sense that some food has fat on it and we store fat in our bodies which will decrease by losing weight. And I would say instead of writing all this, um, you could have mentioned that some students would not know the exact meaning of calories or they will confuse calories and. That would have helped this student in a state in the problem in a clearer way, in a shorter way, say that they would be confu confused between the meaning of calories and mm, this word, and then how you would uh, solve this, right? But this is too much writing here. And then students might confuse an escalator with a lift and then um, highlight that the two are not the same. But again, that solution is weird. That's what do you mean by highlight that the two are not the same? How, how would you highlight that? Whether you use pictures or CCQs or what exactly, we don't know. So you need to be more specific when you write a solution here. Now let's go to anticipated problems with four. Students may spell calories with Y at the end of the word. Um, and then um, present spelling to students and get them to write the word in their notebooks. Well, I mean, um, however, so it's a bit difficult to imagine that intermediate students will make this mistake, you know, because I don't know, it's something that the, um, they must have learned in the previous levels. However, yeah, so not, not a very good uh, anticipated problems here in terms of level. Um, students may not know how to use escalator in a sentence. Again, that's not clear. Um, and uh, why they wouldn't be able to use it in a sentence. You're, this should have been written in a clearer way. What, what would be the problem? What makes escalator different from any other word? Because you can say that about any other word in the world. So you need to be more specific. Like, like it's, just, it's not just enough to say they wouldn't be able to use it in a sentence, right? Uh, why? It's not clear. And then he says here, give an example sentence. So uh, I would say uh, problems related to form are shaky. Um, let's go to um, 
problems related to pronunciation. So students may pronounce membership as two separate words, member and ship. Like, yeah, well, yeah, well, maybe. I mean, some students might say uh, membership. Some Egyptian students might say that, maybe. Not the strongest um, anticipated problem ever, but okay. And the answer is choral and individual trilling. Right, but if I look at uh, this section, I would say, well, not very good with anticipating problems and, and not that bad, I mean, fine. Right, let's go to another example uh, from another um, candidate. And we've got here, students may think that they can use Traffic jam might be confusing as the picture will have multiple elements. Hmm. Okay. Well, it seems that from what the candidate has written that uh, he will be using a picture to clarify traffic jam, but might, the picture might not be enough, so he would use CCQs. Fine. Okay. Right. He said, um, anticipated problems with form. Traffic might be challenging the spelling for some students. Yeah. Elementary students might write it with one F. Okay. Highlight the correct spelling on the board. Fine. Plus one. Students might stress the word jam. And um, the solution is uh, modeling and drilling. But the way it is written is students might stress the word jam. But here I wanted more details. I wanted you to say that um, traffic jams are compound now. The first word is stressed and students might stress the second word, which is wrong. Um, and then you would say, yeah, modeling and drilling. And, but, but this was not detailed enough, right? Another example from another candidate. And he says, students don't seem to understand bloody hell that is the worst anticipated problem i have ever seen in my whole life <laughs> can you imagine that students don't seem to understand understand what what exactly nobody knows i mean what is this and then look at the answer the solution micro teaching well what is that how 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 would you teach and, and, and micro teaching for what and I mean that is a terrible anticipated problem right let's read the second one students are not familiar with the combination of the collocation what what collocations which words and why we don't know and then look at the solution an extra activity is ready what activity what sort of activity and for what exactly and what does this activity focus on? We have no idea. And then the third one, he left it like he, he put nothing in there. So, my friends, in this episode, I talked about anticipated problems. And um, remember that anticipating problems and finding the right solutions for them are very, very important parts of your lesson plan. Uh, whether you're doing your CELTA, your TEFL course, your CELTIS or with Trinity, it's, it's very, very important to prove to your tutors that you, you're capable of doing this. I hope that I gave you good examples. Thank you so much, my friends. See you again in another episode of CELTA Insider. I'll be down there in the comments answering your questions. Bye bye.